I have a great message for you today. One of the things that God is wanting to to bring to the church in this hour is the gift of faith. The Bible says that when Jesus returns, one of the things he's looking for is people of great faith. And our faith has been challenged and rocked over the last few years. And I want to share, continuing on from the last few weeks, and we're going to be talking about a subject that I haven't preached on in 25 years. So there's a reason for that. There's a couple of reasons. I remember planting our first church and I decided that I would tackle this subject and it's every preacher's nightmare because about 15 minutes into my message, I realized I was in over my head. The people's eyes were rolling. Uh, I wanted to go home, but I couldn't because I was preaching. And uh, I vowed I would never touch that subject ever again. The other reason I haven't touched it is probably because I was traumatized as a preacher's kid listening to people preach on this every Sunday for probably the first at least 12 years of my life. And so there's a whole lot of reasons why I've not touched this subject. I'm not saying that they're the right reasons, but they're my reasons. And, uh, and about maybe about a year ago, the Lord began to speak to me about revisiting this area because I felt, and this was before a whole lot of stuff had began to surface in our city. And I felt God say, you're going to need to navigate through this in this hour. And people's faith for their future is going to be severely challenged. They're going to lose hope and they're going to interpret what is happening through a very narrow defeatist mindset. And so you better be armed and ready to equip the church so that we can see through this hour. For what re- whatever reality that you have formed in your life, whatever form of God you've created, that's the way you're going to see life. And, and the truth is that our worldview, our theological views, our family history determine the way God speaks to us. And you go, well, that's not true. And I said, well, just go on Facebook. It's, it's, it's a gift from God to, to see what people truly think through a time of crisis, the way they interpret what's taking place in the world. And so whatever we have built as a belief system in us, when God speaks to us or our form of God or our mindset of God, that's going to be filtered through our, through our soul. And that's why you hear people having dreams and impressions about what God is saying. And they can vary from way over here to way over here. It's like God's schizophrenic. One, one dream says God's about to nuke the world. He's coming back in three years' time. And uh, he's, uh, you know the whole story. And, it, and it's every child's nightmare. Those people could write really good children's books. And over the other side, you ha- hear people having encounters with God and impressions from God that, that is incredibly optimistic. So what is it? Has God lost his mind? Is he waking up each day going heads or tails? Optimistic one day, the ne- next day he wants to blow the world up and he's angry. So we need to understand that the way we interpret scripture, the way we've been brought up, severely impacts our perception of God and his work on earth. Our soul always filters what our spirit is picking up from God. And so what I'm going to share over the next few weeks, you may or may not agree with, and and, and that's okay. It's not the only view, but it's, from my study, it's my view. And I trust that it will take you on a journey of formulating a mindset of what God is doing in this hour and what your future looks like in the kingdom. So Hebrews 11.5 says, By faith, say with me, by faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away so he did not see death. 
and he was not found. So he's a picture of the, the church that is present before the return of Jesus. And the great thing is that almost all theologians believe that Jesus is coming back. And the ones that don't believe that, I wouldn't read. He is coming back, amen. amen. For before Enoch was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So in other words, God is wanting to raise a generation right now that are filled with faith and they please God. That when they wake up in the morning, their view of life is incredibly optimistic. When they look at their city, they are incredibly optimistic. When they look at their own life, they think, my life is fantastic. God has a great plan. You know, Jeremiah had that revelation that God has okay plans depending on when you're born. Now, it's, now God has a plan of hope and future, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to do good and not evil. That's always been the intention of God. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. For those that come to God must believe that God is and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And so we've been saying that when we come to God, we've got to believe that God is. What what is it that we believe about God? Because what we believe about God is the most important thing about us. And then secondly, what we believe about ourselves. So what is it that you believe about God? Well, I, 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 I believe in Jesus. Well, that, that's good. It's, it's a good starting place. But John says he writes to children, he writes to young men and young women, and he writes to mums and dads. So in other words, that when you first get born again, it is enough to drink the milk of the word, which is this. I am righteous in God, and God is a good God. If you get those two things done as a child, you're on the way to growth. If you, if you get a revelation of the eternal goodness of God and that he's made me clean and righteous and I am eternally secure in him, that's the place to begin. But as you know, you don't remain a child for the rest of your life. Hopefully you become a young man, a young woman who knows, knows the word and then you progress into one who is a father and mother and fathers and mothers begin to have a... A, a, a bigger view than just their own world. They know he who's from the beginning. So in other words, they have an understanding of the big plans of God for this universe. Is this making sense? So we need to believe that God is, and we begin to get an understanding that God actually has a plan for this hour. He's not wringing his hands saying, heck, this, is, this world is out of control. The devil's bigger than what I thought he was. We are not in a battle right now of good versus evil. Did you hear that? See, Satan is not the opposite of God. If you want to find an opposite of Satan, then maybe put Michael the archangel. But God is not in opposition to Satan, and Satan is not in opposition to God. They are not two uh, co-equal beings. Satan was created by God. He's a pawn in God's hands. We are not in a battle between good and evil right now. There is no battle. That battle was, if it was a battle, that, that whole thing about the nature of sin was dealt with at the cross. Satan is eternally defeated. Amen? You would think, reading some people's Facebook posts, that Satan is alive and well and a great threat to the kingdom. But God's got a plan. And all things in God's plans are working towards a fulfilment. I said to you last week that God's plan is that through the church, that's you and I, that's God's plan, that he would use you and I to restore the world and bring everything under the feet of Christ. That's the plan of God. And everything right now is working towards the plan of God, which is to bring everything in heaven and on earth under the rulership of Jesus Christ. That is the plan of God. And when God makes a plan, it's going to come to pass. Ephesians 1 verse 9, the NLT says this, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will concerning or regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. 
I'll say it again. God is going to fulfill his own good plan about Christ. Amen? Amen? Stay with me. And this is the plan. At the right time, God is going to bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and earth. That needs to get you excited. Listen to me. This is your paradigm for life. God has a plan that everything in heaven and on earth is going to be brought, it says, under the authority of Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? The church needs to hear that right now. Furthermore, because we, you and I are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For God chose you and I in advance and he will make everything work out according to his plan. So there it is. God has a plan to bring everything under Christ and he's chosen you today, hairy legs, you today that are falling asleep, you today that are excited. No matter where you find yourself in this scope, God has said, hey you! Get up. I'm choosing you right now to get involved in the greatest plan of all creation is that I'm going to use you to subdue everything under the feet of Christ. So think about it. In your workplace, in your city, in your marriage, in your neighbourhood, God is saying, I'm calling you to be part of my plan to bring everything under the influence of Jesus Christ. So, I'm going to seek to tackle in a really simple way. Over the next number of weeks, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 9, Matthew chapter 24, and if God willing, he hasn't nuked me by then, revelation in the new year. Why is that important? Well, This is what most people don't realise. If you've been in church longer than a week, you have come under the spell of a whole lot of teaching and you don't even realise the influence it's had on your life. Through movies, through books, through preaching. Right now, the church as we find it is behaving in a certain way, not realising where that stems from. Have you realised that we can, we can join into habits that we may have picked up from our mother or our father and then our children pick up those habits and they don't know where those habits got, but it's just something that we do. It's a family tradition and nobody knows where it started. I want to say to you, there are things that you may think about God and about the world and about the end times that you've picked up that colour your world And you don't even know where it came from. You may not even be aware of the effect that it has on your worldview. So there's a subject called eschatology. I think I failed that subject in Bible college. I was still traumatised. It's the study of the last things, and maybe it's our day, I don't know, but we're more in the last days than my parents were in. And from my reading, and and as I said, what I'm going to share today, there are alternative views, okay? So so bear that in mind. I'm not getting up. Anyone that gets up and says to you, I, I, I've done study on the end times and I've got it all right and I've got it all down pat. Run for the hills. Now, when it comes to soteriology or, you know, the study of, of the church, we can be quite dogmatic. I'm dogmatic about my views of the Trinity. There are things about the end times. There's some things I understand, the basics I do, which shape my worldview. But if you were to ask me about the millennium, Is that going to occur? Is it a literal thousand years? Are we in it? Is it to come? I would say, I don't know. I've got a theory, but I wouldn't bet my life on it. But the things I'm going to share today, I think are quite clear and are things that will bring you great hope. Amen? Amen. All right. Many of you know about the Reformation in the 1500s with Martin Luther. 
we know that out of that reformation, we, we got this amazing revelation about the just will live by faith. And Martin Luther had an amazing revelation out of Romans, which you and I benefit from today, that we're eternally secure in Christ and we're righteous, not because of our works, but because of his work, the finished work of the cross. But what many people don't know that out of that same reformation came the beginnings of a twisted end time view. Martin Luther was a very passionate man. Have you ever met any passionate people? And uh, he had a bit of an altercation with the Pope. He called the Pope some nasty names. He called him, and this is not how to win friends. He probably should have met Andrew Carnegie, but he called the Pope the whore of Babylon and the beast. Then that's not a way to really get the Pope on side, is it? But he was quite ticked off with the Pope and he called him the whore of Babylon and the beast. To counter this, in 1585, a Jesuit priest, his name was Francisco Ribeira, and he published a book and he placed the writings of Daniel chapter 9 and Matthew 24 and, and the book of Revelation 4 to 19 all into the future. What he was trying to do was distance the, the accusation against the Pope that he was the whore of Babylon and the beast. He was trying to counteract that. So he said, look, all these writings are for something way, way in the future. Well, if you study church history, that wasn't a common held belief. And so his book wasn't a bestseller. It probably sold less than my book. In 1826, is anyone a librarian here? There was a, a lovely librarian working for the Archbishop of Canterbury who discovered this guy's book. And in his wisdom, he thought he would republish it out of national uh, interest. So the book was republished. And uh, a guy that some of you may have heard of called John Darby discovered this book and began to read it. John Darby was... Uh, Born in 1800, he was a Plymouth Brethren uh, evangelist. He began to read this book and he was taken by it. Unfortunately, Darby, before he started writing this, was riding a horse. And uh, he had an unfortunate accident and he fell off the horse and hit his head. And uh, his family said he was never the same after that. And he developed uh, concussion and he became very depressed and darkened in his out view of life, matching his physical ailment with his newfound doctrinal belief was a, uh, was a, I guess, a dangerous potion. And so he began to read this. And at the same time, you've got to remember, you've got people like Charles Spurgeon alive at the same time, who's coming aggressively against this end time negative worldview. Spurgeon said, the Holy Spirit will never allow the accusation to be made against him that he was unable to convert the world. In other words, Spurgeon saying, we're on the upward. The kingdom of God is increasing. And Darby saying, everything's looking terrible. Everything's getting dark. So we've got this clash of worldviews. Darby then divided the world history into what they call dispensations. And he, he came to the conclusion at the end of every dispensation, which whether it's Adam or the flood, there is a natural um, darkness and defeat that comes upon the world. And so he divided the world into dispensations and he believed at the last dispensation there would be anarchy and destruction and only a remnant left of true believers. He also believed that at the end of the, the book of Acts or the Acts of the Apostles, that that was the end of a dispensation and all miracles then had ceased. So you can see his teaching was very, very negative. Yikes. This teaching of Darby got into the USA and there was a man called Cyrus Schofield. You may have Schofield's Bible. Anyone got a Schofield Bible? And what Schofield did, he took the teaching of Darby, which was uh, dispensation. So dispensation is that at the end of every dispensation, something negative, something dark happens. 
no more miracles. And when you're looking to the future, the world is going to get darker and darker. It's going to get harder and harder. And then Jesus will return. Thank you for that. Now, these, now understand, I'm not mocking these people because many of these people were godly people. They loved God. They thought what they were doing was right. But it was tinged in, in, in seeing the world through glasses that I don't believe were the glasses of God. So Schofield takes Darby's doctrine and he decides he's going to take the King James Version and create what they call the Schofield Bible. What was unique about this Bible was it had a commentary in it. That was unusual for its day. So you get today, you've got the study Bible with commentary, footnotes. You didn't have that back then. So Schofield takes Darby's writings, inserts it in his Bible and begins to sell it. What he did, Schofield took his Bible and began to give it to every young pastor, particularly pastors that were going through what we would call Bible college. So think about it. You've got all these new pastors in the early 1900s reading Schofield's Bible, the King James with Darby's view of the end times. What would that do to a fresh generation of young preachers who would then begin to preach the gospel to congregations all across America and then also in our nation of Australia. This is the beginnings of why maybe you think the way you think. In this Bible, the idea was promoted that Matthew 24, Daniel and Revelation particularly chapters 1 to 18, were all referring to future events. And to the Pentecostals. 1948, we have the Latter Rain Movement. And the, uh, the Pentecostals took issue with Schofield's Bible. The greatest issue they took was that Schofield, and through the writings of Darby, had indicated that the gifts of the Spirit but no longer in operation. He believed that the dispensation of miracles, signs and wonders was over. The Pentecostals being Pentecostals said, we're seeing miracles, signs and wonders right now. They are not finished. They are happening in our midst. We know that. So they pushed back on this idea that miracles, signs and wonders had finished. But the Pentecostals took hook, line and sinker, the other side that said, the world's going to get darker. An antichrist is going to appear. There's going to be a great tribulation. And all these prophecies of Daniel and Jesus in Matthew and John in Revelation, they bought this whole concept that in the future years to come, there would be the end of the world, a new age order coming. They, so in one hand, they rejected Darby's teaching. And on the other hand, when it came to the end times, they believed everything about it. Is that making sense to you? I'm laboring on this point before I get into the scripture. I'm painting a picture of what has happened to lead the church to where it is now. So from this came every conspiracy and end time theory. Now, if, you, if you're a student of Facebook, you will see that every time the clouds go dark, do you remember last week? Was it last week, last Friday or the Friday before? When we had our law passed that, that didn't suit or did, maybe it was a good law, bad, I'm not commenting on, on that. But we saw the clouds get dark and all of a sudden it was a new world order coming in. The Antichrist was coming, the mark of the beast. All sorts of things were happening because we've learned to interpret things in the sky, situations around us, leaders arising, all through this end time view of the world and in the 70s we had this great book from Hal Lindsey called The Late Great Planet Earth he sold 35 million copies he predicted that the EEC which is now the European Union I, I grew up listening to 
to evangelists come through our church and they would speak about the EEC. And he, 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 he taught that there was going to be a revived Roman Empire. And this is out of Daniel 2, that would arise in the last times and the Antichrist would come through this. So he began this whole thing on the late great planet Earth. And it sold, as I said, millions of copies. So all across the world, people are reading this viewpoint on the end times and they, they are seeing current events through this lens. It is a big deal. What you've seen in the last two years has been unknowingly shaped by what we have taught in the past. And many people don't even know it. A guy called Ed, Edgar, Edgar, I think, why isn't it? He wrote in 1988, 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. Now, you know why he wrote that, don't you? Because Jerusalem, sorry, Israel was a nation formed in 1948. And they figured because Jesus said a generation uh, won't pass until I return. And so he put 40 years on 1948 and came up with a book that said 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. I was 22 years looking forward to my life. And we had 88 reasons why Jesus was coming back in 1988. He sold 4.5 million copies of this book, Fear Sells. Did you hear that? Fear and darkness sells. The blood moon sells. I said to Karen, why is it that I can get up and preach? Say I preach my best sermon and I get, I think but the greatest one of, you know, as far as hits is like 30,000, right? And that was on tongues. And, but the average one might do a couple of hundred. Why is it that some unknown person can get up, never heard from them before, and, and have a dream about Australia turning into a, a dust bowl and the wrath of God coming. And in two weeks, that person's had 150,000 views on YouTube. And nobody, because fear sells. This guy, Edgar, he sent 300,000 copies to ministers free of charge across America. TBN, you may know TBN. Trinity Broadcast Network. On the day that this guy had predicted that the end was coming, they, they interrupted their broadcast to give special instructions how to prepare for the rapture. Sales for Edgar's book, 89 Reasons Why Jesus Is Coming in 1989, were considerably less. He followed that up with a book in 1993, 1994, and his last classic was in 1997. You'd think the church would learn. 1995, the best-selling book series, Left Behind. Tim LaHaye was influenced by the film that did me over was called A Thief in the Night. Accompanied by Larry Norman's There's No Time to Change Your Mind, The Sun Has Come and You've Been Left Behind. I would come home from school and if my mother, and I think she was playing tricks on me, she would disappear to the neighbour's house and I'd open the front door and that film was playing. <laughs> and there'd be no one there and the clock, the alarm would ring, ding. And I'd been left behind and so I'd run for the phone and I'd think of who's the most spiritual person in our church. And I'd ring them and they'd answer the phone and I'd hang it up. I just want to know that you're there. Legalism and futurism plagued the church back then. See, legalism said even though you're saved because you've sinned, you could go to hell. And that was preached on a regular basis. I've told you before, I used to get saved every week. We had 365 decisions, sorry, 52 decisions for church this year, and it was Andrew 52 times. But nobody had the, the nous to say, Andrew, why do you keep coming out the front for salvation? You're already saved. You're just an immature son. God loves you. 
And just because you've done something wrong doesn't mean you're going to hell. So the church was plagued by legalism and futurism. And so you wonder why people in my generation, many of them no longer go to church. They were, it was too hard, too many hoops to jump through and no hope. And through the Jesus movement, we had a whole generation of people that didn't go to university that that just thought there's no hope. And we wonder why today there's not a lot of Christians in places of power. Chris Valentine uses the example, if you brought a car to me and you said, I want you to, say the car was all broken, I want you to fix it up, panel beat it, spray paint it, just do the best job you can. Money's no, no object. Just do what you need to do. But at the end of the project, I just want to let you know, I'm going to take it to a crash-up derby. What would be the incentive for the panel beater to do an amazing job knowing that when the car rolled out the panel beating shop, it was going to be crashed? And that's what we've done to a whole generation of people. There's no hope. There's no future. Nothing's going to be bright. Everything's going to get bad. 60 million copies of his first book. He wrote 16 of them, the Left Behind series. And do you think that's not shaped the church? Isaiah chapter 60 says, Arise and shine for the light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. That's exciting, isn't it? Lots of light, lots of glory, lots of God's goodness. But it says, but behold, deep darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is upon the people. So here we have this picture in the church's mind that there's going to be some good and a whole lot of evil. And these two forces are going to fight each other until Jesus returns. But what if... What if Isaiah saw a picture of the cross? When was the darkest day in all of history? Was between 12 noon and 3 in the afternoon. The brightest time of the day in the natural, but the darkest moment in all of history. And Isaiah sees deep darkness upon all the people, but he sees Jesus being resurrected and the light shining from that day forward. We are not in a conflict where light's trying to oppose evil. We are in a kingdom that is ever increasing. I had a dream last night, after all the things I said about dreams. And in this dream, and I didn't go to bed thinking about my sermon. Was it in the back of my mind? Maybe. But in this dream, Karen was in a line about to be served and she had a ticket in her hand. And as I looked at the ticket, it said, had on the ticket the number 60. There was a person, a couple behind her that were incredibly aggressive and antagonistic. And they had a ticket and you guess what the number was? 60. And they said, you're in my spot. And Karen said, well, I've got number 60. They said, I've got number 60. You're in my spot. Get out of the way. And I was watching this happen. And there was this conflict between who owned 60 and what position they would be in. And then I woke up and that was the end of my dream. And I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, there is confrontation in the kingdom or even over people's lives as to who owns the interpretation of Isaiah 60. Will it be seen through the lens of darkness or will it be seen through the lens of light and hope? So let's see what Daniel says in the last few minutes. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 2 and let's see what Daniel saw about history And what God would do. Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, has a dream. And he dreams not only about his day, but his dream is a dream right up until the time of Jesus Christ. And in this dream, he has a dream of a large statue. And he says to all the magicians of the land, he says, I've had a dream 
But I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. I want you to tell me what the dream is and then interpret it. And the magician say, hey, we can't do that. You tell us the dream and then we'll interpret it. But he says, no, you tell me what I've dreamt and then you interpret it or I'm going to kill you. Daniel, because he's anointed by God, God gives him the interpretation of the actual dream, what the dream is. But he also shows Daniel the interpretation of this dream. And Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And in the dream, he sees four separate world empires concurrently. He sees his own empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. He sees them one after another. You can read about that in Daniel chapter 2. And what's really interesting in the Roman Empire, he then sees a breakaway where 10 different provinces come up. And in fact, we know in history, under Augustus Caesar from 27 BC to AD 14, the Roman Empire was, seg was, um, d was divided into 10 different empires or provinces. And you can see that on this slide. So let's read Daniel 2.31. You, O king, you were watching and behold, there was a great stature, which was large and an extraordinary radiance. And it was standing in front of you and its appearance was awesome. So Nebuchadnezzar seen into his future through this stature. And the head was made of fine gold, its chest and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs were bronze, its legs were iron, and its feet partly of iron and clay. And you continued to watch, and this is where it's really important. And as you watched Nebuchadnezzar, the stone, uh, until a stone was broken off without hands. So that stone without hands, all theologians will agree it's a picture of Jesus. He is a work, a stone made without the interference of man, which is hands, okay? He's a stone made without hands. And this stone struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay. So in other words, Jesus will appear when the Roman Empire has been divided into 10 different provinces and Jesus will come with his kingdom and he will crush every other kingdom and establish his kingdom which will grow forever. Is that making sense? Then the iron, verse 35, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed to pieces all at the same time. And they were like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, and there was not a trace of them found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain. You should underline that. The stone became a great mountain and filled the entire earth. Did you know Eden was, they believe, wherever that location is, where I don't know where it was, but the Bible tells us in Ezekiel that Eden was formed on a mountain. This stone Jesus becomes a great mountain. In other words, Jesus was going to come and establish a kingdom that was going to recreate what Adam and Eve lost in the garden and Eden would begin again in the life of Jesus and go out. And the purpose of Eden was to subdue the whole earth. Jesus was coming as the second Adam, as a stone, and that stone would, be, would become a mountain and would fill the entire earth. Isaiah 2 tells us that the mountain of the Lord will be established on top of all the mountains. Isaiah saw the same thing. Daniel 2 now, verse 44 it says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed and that kingdom will be not left to another people. It will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it will stand forever. Daniel makes these statements. The kingdom will come through Jesus in this moment in time. So Daniel sees into the future where Rome will be divided into 10 provinces and in that moment, and this is Hundreds of years before, Jesus would come as the stone. His kingdom would be established and it would become a mountain that fills the entire earth. Are you getting this? Daniel saw the kingdom being established and increasing and increasing 
and increasing. The futurists believe that this Roman Empire that we've just read about is for the future, that there will be kingdoms established in the future. And that's why they look where Rome is or the provinces were. They're looking for an antichrist, whatever that means, to appear in Europe and then the kingdom of God will come. They put off this kingdom that Jesus is, that rock that became a mountain. They believe that will come in the future. But my Bible tells me that Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. When Jesus came, the kingdom was established and it's continued to grow and grow and grow. You need to understand futurist people that believe in a new world order, they are waiting for something to appear so the kingdom of God can come. The nature of the kingdom, let's make it clear today, is always progressing. Consider this. The Bible says that the kingdom is brighter and brighter. Proverbs 4.18 says, The path of the just is like the first gleam of the dawn. It goes brighter and brighter until the full light of day. So in other words, that whole concept of brighter, which it means more influence, more revelation. Here's the truth. The longer the church goes, the longer you're a believer in Christ, more revelation and more influence is your divine right and inheritance. The remnant is a old covenant mindset. Gideon started with thousands of men and ended up with 300. Sodom and Gomorrah was nuked and only a couple got out. The flood, the whole earth was destroyed and a handful was saved. It's the remnant mindset. You see, it's all part of this futurist teaching is the world's getting worse and worse. The church is hanging on for dear life and a few of us are going to make it. Now, while we don't believe in the 144,000 like the JWs, a lot of the Pentecostal evangelical church has the same mindset that everything's getting worse and worse and there are only a few of us left that have any faith. The New Testament idea is the opposite. Do you know, 3,000 people were saved on the day of Pentecost. It's pretty impressive, isn't it? But back in 2010, 3,000 people were getting saved every 54 minutes. Jesus set in motion a kingdom that began as a rock that's now becoming a mountain that's filling the whole earth. Isaiah 9, 7 says, of his increase of his government, there is no end. Isaiah 11, 9, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Yes. Have you ever thought of that phrase, as the waters cover the sea? It's a strange phrase, isn't it? As the water covers the sea. It covers the sea pretty well, doesn't it? Have you ever gone out fishing and discovered there was a hole in the water that wasn't covering the sea? <laughs> Completely, entirely. It says, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. And that's not just, I, I know God. A deep understanding, even those who aren't believers. Do I believe everyone will be saved before Jesus returns? No, but I believe more will be saved that aren't saved and I believe those that aren't saved will know the effects of God in a real way. And they made a choice not to believe, but they will know the goodness of God. They will see evidence of a good God. The earth, Habakkuk says, will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Numbers 14, 21. As truly as I live, God says, all the... Now, listen, this is God. As truly as I live... He's giving you a clue now. This is guaranteed. Listen to this. All of the earth. How much? All. Not just Melbourne or America. Okay, God hasn't got Americanitis. God believes that 
the kingdom of God is bigger than America. It covers Australia. It covers India, China, Russia, Afghanistan. He says, all of the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. That is an amazing verse. As truly as I live, this rock that Daniel saw, that consumed every other kingdom, smashed them to pieces. These, think about it, the Roman Empire was the dominant force on the planet. You think about what intimidates you today, whether it's whatever realm you live in, dance, music, education, law, government. You think that could never happen. God's glory could never penetrate that. He, the Bible says through Daniel that this kingdom, the kingdom that Jesus introduced will shatter every other kingdom until it becomes the mountain that all nations stream to. That's a promise from God. And yeah, well, I haven't seen it yet. Well, the reason you haven't seen it yet is because you interpret the world through darkness. And I figure if most Christians see a dark world, then what you see in your heart is what you speak through your mouth. And we are speaking. Every time there's a pandemic or something go wrong, we are decreeing darkness, a new world order, the Antichrist, the tribulation, all garbage in my mind, all a misunderstanding of Scripture. And our world becomes darker and darker. And whatever we speak with our mouth, can these bones live? No, Lord, they can't. Let's nuke them. So we prophesy over our city all this garbage and we wonder why our world's like it is. But God said, don't worry about that. As long as I live, this is a guarantee that all the earth will be filled with my glory. So that tells me that God's going to grab a hold of Christians. And that dream I had about the, the pull over Isaiah 60, we're going to get a revelation that light dispels darkness. When Jesus came to planet Earth, he was the light of the world and the darkness could not put him out, could not comprehend him, could not diminish it, because they could not squash that light. The light overcomes darkness. And we'll get a revelation that wherever we go, we carry a kingdom inside us that is an overcoming kingdom. Listen to me. You carry the presence of Jesus wherever you go. You walk into a room. The Bible says that kingdom within you is an ever-increasing kingdom. You are the dominating force in every circumstance. It's not about your IQ. It's not about any of that. It's about whether you carry the presence of the rock, that mountain within you that will consume every other mountain. Your wisdom is greater. Your anointing is greater. Your future is greater. Everything about you because we are in a kingdom that is ever increasing. And I say to this church, we will be a church that is a light in this city. We are a church that is hope filled about our future. We are a church that looks at the end times with great optimism. We are a church that plans way into the future. And if Jesus comes back in the meantime, all power to you. We'll be happy about that as well. But we are long range thinkers. For my children, I'm thinking about them going into every sector of society. I'm planning in my mind for their children. I'm even coming up with names for their children already. I'm thinking way into the future. Nova sounds like a good name. Just write that down. And we close. And all God's people said, oh, amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 25, the plan. For Jesus must reign until God has put all things, all his enemies under his feet. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. Jesus is in heaven now and God is placing everything under his feet. And the body is the means that God will place everything under his feet. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. And when all things are subjected to him, which is Jesus, then Jesus himself 
will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, that God will be all in all. This is the promise. Everything that we see will be placed under the feet of Jesus through the church, and then Jesus will take that and offer it up to God so God would be all in all. That is my victorious eschatology. That's part one, of which is Daniel 2. We are in a kingdom that is being established and increasing and increasing and increasing. Our world is getting brighter and brighter. More and more people are getting born again. More and more believers are getting a revelation of their destiny. This is our inheritance. And all God's people said, Amen. Stay tuned for part two next week. 